They're going to defend the whole border against all neighboring nations. That, that's what I hear. Yeah, well, eventually. I mean, so far, they're not even mobilized yet. Yeah, I know. April 4th, 1941. The Germans wouldn't be able to attack until May, they said. They didn't have enough men or armor on the continent until then, they said. We can hold them just fine, even with a skeleton crew, they said. Well, they didn't tell Irvin Rommel. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, there was a coup in Yugoslavia after Prince Regent signed the agreement to join the Axis powers. The Italian fleet suffered a big defeat in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Japanese won in China, the Allies advanced in Eritrea and Abyssinia, and the Germans in North Africa. And that advance, under Erwin Rommel, continues this week. On the 30th, his forces advanced towards Mersa Brega. Only part of the British 2nd Armoured Division is in any position to oppose him, and most of the Australians are at Benghazi and the rest at Tobruk. The next day, Rommel attacks Mersa Brega, but his attack is halted after a fierce battle. On the 1st, though, the Allies withdraw from Mersa Brega, leaving behind the only solid defensive positions before the wide-open plateau of Cyrenaica. This withdrawal soon develops into a major retreat, with the armour pulling back to Masus. On the second, Rommel advances and takes Agadabia. He soon decides that he's going to cross the desert of Cyrenaica, much like the British did two months ago, and see if Philip Neem, the general commanding officer in Cyrenaica, is planning to fight for the Jebel. Even if they are, though, that desert crossing is going to worry their southern flank. However, Rommel's forward units run out of fuel. The 5th Light Division's commander asked for a four-day halt to bring up ammunition and gasoline. Rommel had him empty all his trucks, leaving the division stranded immobile in the desert for 24 hours and send them back to depots to bring up supplies. Instead of four days, they were on the move again in 24 hours. They then divide into several columns, two taking main routes toward Masus and Mahili, and with the Italians on the coast toward Benghazi. A general complains that he's being asked to advance into impassable terrain. Rommel himself drives ahead 20 kilometers to prove him wrong. On the 3rd, Rommel writes his wife, We've been attacking since the 31st with dazzling success. There'll be consternation amongst our masters in Tripoli and Rome, and perhaps in Berlin too. I took the risk against all orders and instructions because the opportunity seemed favorable. I can't sleep for happiness. But what are the British commanders doing during all of this? Well, on the 2nd, Archie Wavell, in command of the whole Middle Eastern theater, flies in from Cairo and brings back in Richard O'Connor, whom he wishes to once again place in field command. Now, depending which source you believe, O'Connor either refuses and says he'll take just an advisory role, or Wavell decides to leave Neem in charge with O'Connor as his advisor. See, Wavell still thinks Rommel is not ready for a major offensive, and thus, plans to make a big defense at Benghazi, which he thinks is the German objective. However, Wavell's defensive orders for Benghazi are not received until the 4th, by which time it's already been abandoned and the Axis take it that day. They are on the move again towards Masus and Mahili and have penetrated the southern British flank. The Luftwaffe destroys a British column of 21 withdrawing trucks, sending tons of Allied gasoline into the desert. And as the week ends, a rare state of confusion existed in 13th Corps, caused by an absence of information, hopelessly bad signal communications, and the speed of the German advance. Yet, a British advance far to the southeast, from Harar towards Addis Ababa, continues this week. Two companies of the 1st Transvaal Scottish Regiment enter Dera Dawa without opposition on the 29th. By this time, after the crazy pursuit across Abyssinia, British and Commonwealth forces are as far from their starting points as London is on a line to Athens. For real. However, the taking of the port of Berbera two weeks ago had cut 900 kilometers off the lines of communication. Also, taking Deradawa gives a valuable aerodrome from which the South African Air Force can now harass the enemy columns retreating to the capital. They're doing the same thing in Eritrea, actually. The RAF is gunning the refugee columns of Luigi Frucci's broken Italian forces on the Karen Asmara Highway. 
But here, reinforcements have arrived from Addis Ababa and Gondar and take positions before Ad Teklesan. These are actually really strong natural defenses. Stronger even than Karen was, but the Italians have no wish to fight another battle of Karen. On the first, a car with a white flag flying comes out of Asmara to negotiate terms of surrender. The signal sent to headquarters in Khartoum announcing the surrender of Asmara ended with the assurance that this was not, repeat not, an April Fool. The British capture the entire reserve of clothing and equipment for the Italian East African armies, including one and a half million shells and three million rounds of ammunition. Frushi flees to Tigre province where he thinks he can still resist. Platt is having all movement on the roads there bombed. Masawa is the last town of import still not taken. Well, that offensive seems to be nearing its end, but there are those that are soon to begin. Adolf Hitler is going to invade not just Greece, but also Yugoslavia, primarily because he wants to use their railway system for deployment against Greece and redeployment after that for his summer offensive against the Soviet Union. Yugoslavia does have a million-man army, though, in 28 infantry divisions and three cavalry, but only has two tank battalions of 100 vehicles each, and they are obsolete. Well, other than tanks, it isn't really a motor vehicle kind of army. It relies on horses, mules, and oxen, some 900,000 of them. But you know what? Since the coup last week, that army is still not mobilized. British Chief of Staff Sir John Dill pays a secret visit to the Yugoslavian General Staff this week on the 1st, and he reports that it behaves as if it had months in which to make decisions, and more months in which to put them in effect. And though there is a meeting with Greek commander Alexandros Papagos in Athens the 3rd and 4th, the Yugoslavian general staff declines to make a joint strategy of concentrating forces in the south of the country to mutually support the Greeks and the British forces joining them, but instead decides to line the whole border with Italy, Germany, Hungary, and Bulgaria that's 1,600 kilometers. I'll quote someone else quoted in Keegan now, and then quote Keegan himself again. Frederick the Great said, he who defends everything defends nothing. And John Keegan writes, no country has perhaps ever as irrationally dispersed its forces as the Yugoslavs did in April 1941, seeking to defend with ancient rifles and mule-borne mountain artillery one of the longest land frontiers in Europe against Panzer divisions and 2,000 modern aircraft. Well, such an attack is still in the future as the week ends. And Yugoslavia is not the only nation having a coup this spring. From the 1st to the 3rd, a coup in Iraq sees a new government installed. Coup leader Rashid Ali and officers of the Golden Square are opposed to the British presence in Iraq. Britain quickly sends troops from India and the Middle East to hopefully secure vital oil supplies. Hitler orders Vichy French arms sent in from Baghdad and German military experts to help Rashid stay in power. There are more political changes around Europe. On the second, Hungarian Prime Minister Pal Teleki commits suicide rather than be responsible for allowing German troops to cross Hungary, which would lead the Allies to declare war on Hungary. We broke our word out of cowardice. We have allied ourselves to scoundrels. We will become a nation of trash. I am guilty. That is from his suicide note. He is a controversial figure, for while he did, I guess nobly, try to preserve his nation's autonomy, he is also responsible for some very serious anti-Semitic legislation. Adolf Hitler is legislating by decree this week for Germany. On March 30th, he issues the Commissar Decree to all his senior commanders about the upcoming invasion of the USSR. This declares, the war against Russia cannot be fought in knightly fashion. The struggle is one of ideologies and racial differences and will have to be waged with unprecedented, unmerciful, and unrelenting hardness. He explains that all Russian commissars are criminals and must be liquidated. Many of his officers are shocked, but Hitler tells them that he will not change his orders and they must be carried out with unconditional obedience. As for the Soviet Union, from March 26th, 
Order number 008130 to the Western Special Military District is to institute a state of readiness until June 15th. Baltic, Western, and Kiev district commanders are ordered to strengthen their fortifications. 58, 35, and 43,000 men respectively begin the work. But in many cases, there are shortages of things like concrete. So what is supposed to be a continuous line has gaps anywhere from 5 to 50 miles long. Also, at the urging of Semyon Timoshenko and Georgi Zhukov, Joseph Stalin agrees to call up 500,000 men to the border districts, and a few days later, another 300,000 to the fortified districts. But it might be too late. Richard Sorge writes from Tokyo, According to the German ambassador, the German general staff has completed all its preparations for war. In Himmler's circles and those of the general staff, there is a powerful trend to initiate war against the Soviet Union. German SS chief Heinrich Himmler has been training his SS men so hard for this that since January, 10 have been killed just in training. On the 3rd, he summons SS commanders to Berlin and tells them to prepare for the attack on Greece as the special task forces prepare for the USSR. On the 4th, those forces are told they will be virtually unrestricted behind the lines and authorized to take executive measures affecting the civilian population. That is mass murder. On April 3rd, Hitler issues Directive 26, details for cooperation with his allies in the coming Balkan campaigns. On the 4th comes Directive 27, specific orders for the attacks on Greece and Yugoslavia. These attacks are to take place next week. And this week comes to an end. A week seeing Axis gains in North Africa, Allied gains in East Africa, a coup in Iraq, a suicide in Hungary, and orders, orders, orders from Adolf Hitler. There's not much I can conclude in today's conclusion except the obvious. Next week, Germany will invade Greece and Yugoslavia. Next week, a great many people will die. If you'd like to turn the clock back 20 years and see the young Soviet Union making war of its own in the West, you can click here for our Between Two Wars episode about the Polish-Soviet War. Our Time Ghost Army soldier of the war is Jon Henning Opegard. The Time Ghost Army is what funds this channel and indeed all of our work. So please support us at patreon.com or timeghost.tv and subscribe and, and ring that bell and look both ways before crossing the street and I'll see you next time. Thank you.